lounge and sun. Welcome back to the Comic Lounge. My name's Ryan, and with me today, I have a very awesome guest. I have Mr. Kelly Jones with me, Sandman, Batman, Dead Man, tons of dope stuff over the years. I am super excited to have you on the channel finally, man. Welcome. Thank you. So first off, you know, I usually ask this question to everybody that I talk to for the first time. I always sure. like to kind of hear, like, what started that love, that passion for comic books? Like, What really started it was... The old, I, I have to, when I think about it, it was the uh, Marvel 66 cartoon. And if anyone knows that, it was uh, basically they were just taking panels from Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Don Heck, those guys. I used to love to draw. And when I saw it, uh, it just made this big impact on me. They were, I just thought they were wonderful. Um, I know as animation goes, it's, you know, pretty simple but it's jack kirby mm -hmm. and uh i love the voice actor i love the whole thing and around that same time my older brother uh when summer break came came home with a stack of comic books that the teacher had given out basically they were comic books that were in his class that if you finished your assignment early he would you just go read some comics right that is a great teacher whoever that is awesome whoever he was. and he just came home with a stack and my brother I don't know. He didn't say here they are. He just, you know, they gave them to him. He came home. He put them on a table and I was addicted to heroin from that moment. Um, I just started. In fact, I can remember the first one. Uh, the first comic book was, uh, I believe, Fantastic Four 83 mm -hmm. that was in there, uh, along with a couple of these big Marvel reprint books. And I was just out of my mind, like, hey, that looks like these cartoons you know mm -hmm. and it just started the ball rolling i mean i think it's funny like i mean i associate you more with dc i mean the credits i i, I listed off at first but obviously i'm, I'm thinking no, more of a marvel no, kid, right I, look i'm as shocked as anyone i started off as total marvel boy you know and i think uh it's funny to me too but what happens is the existential crisis of realizing at a certain point you know i'm a big fan of these marvel comics they're a huge part of, and still are a huge part of my life but at my core i'm a dc comics thinking artist you know uh, now that i i mean i would pick up various dc things and generally because of an artist or something like that but i didn't know the lore of dc the way man i knew marvel and uh marvel comics at that time it wasn't like they were easy to get their their stores they existed on the east coast because i'm in california mm -hmm. but you could go to like uh flea markets and find them so i would just beg my parents to go along with them to any of these places they would go and um and they would i remember my parents would go get uh because in california there's um uh forever kind of like farmers markets everywhere they're everywhere now but then that's how it is just everything's grown around you so they would go and I would make a beeline to this one fellow who had boxes and boxes of comics. And I would just literally turn over. If, if my parents owed that guy because I was a well-behaved, do my chores kid. Mm -hmm. So I could get my money to pay for my fixes, you know? I totally get that. I was, yeah. I was exactly the same way. And like, I mean, obviously like for me, it was, it was different, like coming into comics, but like, I know that anytime I saw boxes of books used or comics, like I was yeah. always going no matter where it was. Mm -hmm. There's a magic to it that I think collecting mixed with the love of, of what you're collecting, that th there is a magic in it. And even if you're getting, I mean, I got to the point to where I was buying a lot of comics that I wasn't that interested in because they were so cheap and later on they i became huge fans of those comics but the sheer excitement of coming across an issue we're looking for or uh that story that you didn't know would knock you out and knocked you out um it's an it's a thing that i didn't think my friends at that age had the same thing happening to them mm -hmm. you know they just didn't have it and so um but i wasn't someone to say hey you have to do this but for me it was this this thing actually comics are uh, such a kind of a private thing you know whether you make them or read them you're by yourself right so if you find other people who are as into this you know 
that becomes your lifelong friends. Yeah, I think it's funny that you mentioned that because that's my story. Like, I didn't have friends that liked mm -hmm. comics. No, nobody. It wasn't yeah. until it wasn't until my brother was born, and we have an eleven and a half years apart. So it yeah. wasn't until he became old enough to ask me what they were. Yeah. I think he was like my first, like you know, real like well, comic book in, buddy in my know? day. And certainly, girls didn't like. <laughs> like yeah, that's you, were, for sure. you were out. Yeah. <laughs> you were that was over. But even that, even puberty, did not drive out my love of comic books <laughs> that's true me either man i have never <laughs> dropped comics my entire i just figured life. okay i'll find a girl one day who will at least just tolerate it <laughs> yeah. that's that's the and dream man yeah and i did i found the girl who tolerated it same so. here my my wife's that that woman that tolerates my comic book love yeah. you know <laughs> because there's a lot worse that we could do <laughs> you know yeah. i'm sure they have friends who go oh he drinks too much or he does it, it, it. <laughs> well my my husband is going driving me nuts looking for swamp thing seven you know that's yeah. that's a better problem <laughs> yes yeah i mean i'm the one that like every day like the door there's a knock on the door there's more packages of yep. comics that i'm ordering yep. and isn't that the biggest rush yes and that is a huge rush and i've never gotten over that i've never gotten over that i still pick up you know, filling in collection stuff, parts here and there. And I've never gotten over that. I mean, there's something magic. I, I know people put them in the plastic thing, but the magic is in those things. And I don't know. It's like seeing it. I always tell people, it's like when you finally see the director's cut or you hear the, the way uh, on an LP, the way the song was supposed to sound, the way it did sound. And it's the same thing. I mean, it's on that paper. You get a letters page. Mm -hmm. You're in the you're in the moment of that moment, however many years ago it was, and there, it's canon. It's in the it's in it's a history. I mean, it's it's the thing that makes comics connected, is that you can read something, and then go back further and further and further and see how all of it was put together, how it's still evolving. And uh, that's why I'm a big canon guy. Whatever it was, that's what it is. And you stick with it and you build upon it. Yes. When you deviate from it and ignore those things, it's like changing the rules in a, in, in some kind of uh, football, baseball, basketball, whatever. When you change rules, then that means the guys, the teams from a long time ago are disconnected from what you're doing now. It's the two separate things. So... As emperor of comics, I'd say do whatever you want, but you're building on what have already happened. You I know? totally agree. Yeah, you're building on it. And once you change it, once you move the puzzle pieces or bite the ones to make them fit in the jigsaw puzzle, um, it's not that that character, that books is essentially canceled to me. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh no, now, you know. Um, but luckily for me, that's what, back issue markets are you know but that's how i started was back issue markets everything it's that's, always been trying to catch up you yeah. know no that's the joy of comics like you know like how you said that feeling's never gone away like i no. still feel like a little kid waiting for something to come in the mail mm -hmm. you know when i get that i like and i'm 36 and I, I don't think that i don't see that ever going away it's it never same... does when i was when when finally and again, there were no stores and it was hard to, if you hit the, if you hit the little convenience store, they had very spotty distribution. Mm -hmm. so, God, I was a kid and I, and my mom helped me fill out a subscription. They used to do subscriptions where you could order the books. You'd send it to Marvel, DC, whoever, Charlton, they would send you every month those books you ordered. So she let me order seven books and then that was a hard day but the hard night before i had to pick which seven books i was going to follow and it obviously was like ff and spider-man iron man the avengers stuff like the thor i just love thor so i'm doing this and and uh man the excitement it said expect the first books in six weeks so i sign the thing my mom writes out the check and sends it off and then it was like, I, I'm not joking. It was more exciting than when Christmas was coming. Mm -hmm. It was, the, and then when it would come, I'd be at school and my mom would just put the mail uh, right in the front door. When you come in, there'd be whatever you get. Of course, as a kid, you don't get anything. Right. But I was getting seven comic books whenever, you know, when they were coming out. And it was as exciting, man, when they came, they came. And, you know, they, they just put them in a, like a, brown 
Yeah, they were perfect. folded, right? Yeah, you know, some uh, sometimes they were, sometimes they were flat. I didn't care. It was like here they are, and I because I would go to the to to like. Well, my brother hated this. At first, he liked it. He, for, and then he hated. It. He was older than me too, and he uh, got his driver's license, and so he wanted to drive. You know, you always want to drive when you get that license, mm -hmm. and. Uh, so he volunteered to take me to all these convenience stores to hunt for comics. And I think after a month, he was sick of it because I just wouldn't, it, it, you know, then he realized what, it, this is a monster, you know? <laughs> and I began to know the guys running these stores and they would tell me when the shipments would come in. So I would be there because I said, you have, to, man, they're going to run out of Son of Satan. I have to get there. They don't order too many. You know? And they would go, your priorities are screwed. <laughs> I, to I totally get that feeling because I remember yeah. like just making my mom like run all over. Um, I, I'm, I live in LA in the San Fernando Valley. So making her drive all over the valley, I'd look in the phone book. Like people yeah. nowadays don't even know what phone books are. But, yeah. you know, like I'd flip and I'd look at the comic book store in the in the yellow pages. Yeah. And I'd call every single one looking uh -huh. for those issues. Like yep. I miss, sometimes I miss that hunt. Like no, that. the hunt, the hunt is everything. Yeah. Okay. The, the exhilaration of it is everything. I'm quite certain that the cheetah is more excited running down the gazelle than when he's sitting there chomping on the gazelle. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the thing it was to get the comic. Now, when, when you read that comic, it knocks you out, you pu put it in a bag and store it, but you come back five years later and you're as excited again to have that book. It's, it's hard to explain this um, unless you have this book spider bite as it were as long as it's infection or whatever you want to call it yeah. but it doesn't go away and you may think it goes away until that thing comes back and you're you're right there and then uh for me I, my my kids are in their uh you know 20 years old or so and for them to have passed me up maturity wise <laughs> because they're like Dad's reading a comic, can't bother. <laughs> it's like dad's all excited over his comic book. And it's like they've moved through that. And I'm going, I'm never letting go, you know? Yeah, I love hearing that, man. I love hearing that excitement. Like all these, like, you know, like that you're still so excited because like I don't see myself ever getting out of that either. Like I just, I have the same excitement now that I did when I picked up that first comic. Like I- Well, I never thought I'd be drawing comic books. So, so it, it was a, it was a, uh, just a, hole I fell in and mm -hmm. and then I did it wasn't like I'd know a lot of guys and it was their goal their their whole life I, I only I for me I always thought well I like doing it but I didn't draw a lot of comics I would draw other things because I I didn't know how you did it I didn't know how you would there was no way now you kind of know but it was um and even now it's a lot harder I think but what happened is I I became so not afraid to draw so much but i became intimidated because these were people i was reading their books and collecting mm -hmm. and i remember like feeling like i was going to throw up around doug minch because i'd been reading his comic books my whole life and then i'm sitting with him in a car and he's he's going on about i think we need to do this i think we need to do that i just met him and i'm he says, Kelly, you look green. <laughs> Are you car sick? And I said, no, I'm starstruck. <laughs> and I'm going to vomit because it's you. <laughs> yeah. And he started laughing so hard. <laughs> and he says, why? And I go, y and I did this kind of thing. I said, when I found Master of Kung Fu number 32, and then I went and you did Godzilla and then the Fantastic Four. And I'm just going off like this. And uh, I said, I don't know if you had that when you came in, because it was just, you know, Stan and those guys. Right. And you came in with, I said, but I do have that, you know, I embarrass myself around these people. Danny O'Neill, I was catatonic, you know, you just, you, you, yeah. you know, it's that thing where you just, you try to talk and you, <laughs> because you can't, it just won't come out, <laughs> you know, um, I always, I always tried to say, well, if I'm really quiet, they'll think I'm smart <laughs> rather than I'm numb. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, it's crazy. You know, comic books weren't, you know, like it's, it's cool seeing the generations after, you know, like during the golden age of silver age, when the fans 
of those books start becoming creators. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, when did you just, I mean, like, I know you started drawing before com before you read comics, yeah. Um, yeah. but when did you decide to make a career of it? Like who were your uh, artistic I was influences? I kind of sort of do, I would draw a little bit of like comic book stuff, but then I'd go off and draw monsters or draw what, you know, whatever. And, but I liked using ink. So there was a graphic quality to it that they could see. And the great, I was a fan of, and went to go get book signed uh, by Marshall Rogers, the who, yes. great Marshall Rogers. Mm -hmm. And he was just looking at people's work and annihilating it. Not being mean. He just said, well, you know, basically keep doing it, but you got to start all over again. Or you're just, this is not working. And and I didn't bring any art. I, I came with my stack of comics that he had done. And a um, friend of mine, though, did bring some of my art. And he didn't tell me. And so we get up there and he says, hey, my friend really likes. I was 16 years old. And he says, my friend really, uh, I think, draws pretty good. But, you know, he's not certain what he wants. You know, he's not even talking about doing this. But what do you think? And Marshall Rogers, you know, does that beat where I'm just dying. Mm -hmm. And he said, do you have a few minutes to talk? And he made room for me to come around behind and he told everyone in his line, which was immense. I'll get back to you. This is I this I want to talk to this kid. And he told me what worked, what didn't, what to work on, what to uh, what he liked. But he felt it was all there. That is the first time I thought, well, maybe I have maybe I could do this because I as horrifying as that experience was seeing him really tear apart these other people I, I believed him then not because he liked me but he was saying these things and then uh, uh on on how you do it and how how to think really a lot of it was how to think For, I, I think when i was about 19 or so i got hired as an inker because i kept inking all the time and i never thought that would happen i was going to college then and so I tried to do both for about a year, year and a half or so. And it just got to be, you you, you either did one or the other because they were so time consuming. And I, and I was such a green artist. I didn't know what I was doing. And they had to hold my hand the whole time. And, um, and it took 16 hours a day to get it right. You know, it's just, you're learning. Right. But that, but what kept it going from being exhausted was sheer excitement. I was really getting to do this. And when you see your books published, it's really amazing. And then you're talking to the people who make them. And they're very, you know, they're like, hey, how's it going? Blah, blah, blah. And I said, I'm not at the hey, how's it going level yet? I I gotta, I gotta ask, can you sign? I used to do, I used to be terrible about those things. I mean, I would completely get I still do. I mean, I'll meet someone uh and there's I've been reading their books a long time or I read, young new guys or whatever. If I like them, I'm I'm always that way because I think you're imprinted like a baby duck to follow whatever you first see. And that's the same thing. I was imprinted by comics mm -hmm. and loved it. And um, it's just the way it is. I love it. I, I, I would not I would not have it any other way. I mean. I love that, dude. You know, like comics are the best. I I, I say it all the time. It's my favorite medium. I, I love film. I love television. I love music. But like form of entertainment, if you. Well, I think it's the I think it's the most eccentric, Ryan. It's yeah. the most uh, it's one guy, maybe two guys. And they're telling you a story. It isn't a big committee room or it isn't something that had to go through many producer filler uh, uh, filters. Mm -hmm. It's basically a guy. Doing it they print it it comes to you so it's almost and and so that guy's eccentricity is i mean jack kirby yeah. or you know you can go to that or you can anyone you want now if 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 there's something that makes comics cooler than all other mediums is it's the one-on-one -on -one eccentricity of that creator to that fan to that reader mm -hmm. And there's there it's it's almost like he's sitting that 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 whoever's doing it, it you're at a campfire and they're telling you a ghost story or something. Yeah, I like that analogy. I like that a lot, yeah. man. Um, well, what what was your first published work? I know you said inking was how you got into the biz. First published work was uh, five 
pages over Don Perlin in The Defenders. And I don't even know if I got credit. I think it was just like various or whatever. I might have. I can't remember. But that was a big deal when they sent me that comic book through the mail. Now, I didn't get the job, but they liked it enough to say, well, here, try this. And I would get a pin up here or pin up there. And I got a pin up to the Micronauts by Jack, uh, Butch Guys. And Butch was looking for an inker. He wanted someone to more match his more graphic, slick style. And they gave me a, a couple of pinups of his, and he he liked them. So they gave me an issue to to, to uh, see how I would do. And it was like a 30... In those days, um, The Micronauts was like a 32-page bi-monthly book. So the first 10 pages, I stink. I mean, I know I'm, I just, I'm, I don't know. I'm just stinking. And they called me and said, well, these could be better, but you know, blah, blah, blah. But Butch would call me and say, do not worry about it. Let's do the next 10, see how you do. But he would give me a little advice. Next 10 were about 50% better than the first 10. And he calls me up and they said, hey, this, now this is looking good. But I knew in my heart I still wasn't there yet. And when I did the last 10, they said, you got the job. You know, this is exactly, this is actually exceeding what we had, were hoping for. And um, I learned a lot under Butch. Uh, learned a lot from Marvel at that time. And um, it was a blast. That that first year and a half or so inking Butch was an absolute blast. Yeah, it's interesting that you said how like you got five pages of defenders because I was recently watching the Mignola documentary and yeah. how th and then he said too like that was his first it was five pages yeah. so it's just interesting to hear like uh, how we were, were just... I, I believe he was in the same book his work is in that same issue oh wow um, so why I were believe... they is that what they would do is just pass issues around to kind of keep the keep well the train i think moving? they had a late book and okay. they were looking for an inker on that book um and uh i believe the uh kim de Mulder is the one who they gave the job to and I think what they did with both of us or with, with their, I mean, Mike and I came in when Marvel did a, hey, guys, we're, we're looking for talent, send in your samples. And so I sent in some stuff and I didn't hear anything. I guess none of us did. I didn't hear anything. And I forgot about it until they called. And at that point, they said, we're going to send out some stuff. And, you know, I didn't know that I didn't know any of the other guys. So we we're going to give you five pages. And, uh. And I don't know if that's how they did it, but that's how they did it then. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times you came up uh, as an understudy to an artist, as an assistant to an artist. They got to know you that way. There really wasn't the uh, independent, like the independent market now does is not subservient to Marvel or DC. It's its own thing and just as credible and can a lot of times sell more. But back then it didn't really exist. There was no farm system, as it were. So uh, it it was... If you if you were to look at it that way, I think comics were that was frontier days where you're just going in that covered wagon moving into, you know, you don't know where you're going. And then when I got in comics, I would classify as the Wild West then because anything could happen. Mm -hmm. And the editors were the final say in something. So if an editor liked you, it didn't matter what the publishers thought, didn't matter what anyone else thought. Every other editor could hate your work. But if that editor liked you, you were working. And I don't know if that happens now. Uh, they can pick and choose, but I mean that they were runner. They would run their own kingdoms. So when do you make the move, like to Penciler and from Marvel to DC? And well, Butch quit, and I thought my job was over. I was naive, and I thought my job was over. I didn't think, oh, I'll ink someone else. And he quit, and the uh, editor Ralph Macchio had said, "Look, Butch is leaving as of this whatever issue." And um, I'd like you to, I've seen your samples that you sent in, and I think they're pretty good, your penciling. And I freaked out and I said, you know, Ralph, I, I, I'm not a penciler. I penciled those so I'd have something to ink to show you. That took me forever to do those. And they were all geared towards my wheelhouse, not like, I don't know what I'm going to get from a writer. He just blew that off and he says... Well, I've looked at a few other people. They're not making me happy. He's very New York, too. And then, you know, 
and he's and so I'm not going to embarrass myself doing his accent, but it's a heavy New York accent. And he said, uh, uh, "I've looked at other people. I don't think they have what I want. You do. You're going to do." It was like you're going to do this. I've made my mind up. So get it in your head. You're going to do it. And he and I said, "But I don't know. I don't know how. What do I do?" He says, "You're going to get. I'm going to send you a script. You're going to start drawing it. Anytime you have a question, you call me, and I'll walk you through this." And he was good to his word. And um, he had great, Marvel had a, a thing they used to do and they would just teach you, if there's several panels on a page, pick one, make it great, just get the other ones done. And, um, but get that page done that day. And by the end of the month, you'll have 22 really good panels, if that's all it is. And if you have a comic book with 22 really great panels, you have a hit. I, I thought that sounded like, wow, that's all 22. I, but he, when you start doing it, that's true. That's true. And, and, uh, and so he, it helped me a lot that way. And he, um, found me a great inker in, in Bruce Patterson and which really helped me, uh, cause he fixed all my crap that, you know, I was drawing monsters. I wasn't drawing girls. And here's Marionette and the Micronauts, who's a beautiful girl. And I'm going, oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? You know? <laughs> and so, and, and so I, I would draw it. And, you know, Bruce was always so kind because he would say, Kelly, they're pretty enough. They're fine. They're, they're, yeah. I said, well, can you make them prettier? Because <laughs> Butch was awesome. And, you know, it's like, I kept looking at Butch and they said, oh, fine, look at Butch, but you, you just do your own thing. And they would really push you to go into your own way of thinking after the irony of what pretty much why I left Marvel though was when I started getting more confident with penciling I asked to ink myself and they just at that point the irony was no you don't get to ink yourself and when I would ink myself here or there like because of a deadline problem or some snafu they would um really like it they would respond like wow that's really good and I said, okay, can I have just one issue? I'll get ahead. I'll do it. And they said, no, you can't. We, we, no, they were all about the deadline. Unless I was John Byrne or Frank Miller, they're not going to let me pencil ink myself, you know? Yeah. And uh, not that I went and asked at DC, but DC out of the blue called a few years, I, I mean, around 87 or so, and said, would you be interested in coming over? And so I gave it a shot. I wanted to draw horror comics anyway, and I gave it a shot. They gave me Dead Man, but they didn't know I wanted horror. I didn't say to them that. It just was a fluke of nature. Wow. Uh, so comic careers are generally that. And um, they gave it to me, and I decided at the same time I really wanted things to be in the book the way I see them. And if I'm dumped, I'm dumped. If they fire me, I'm fired. If it's over, it's over. But I'm going to at least try it. And and they dug it. They dug this thing. I didn't get to ink myself. So when they offered the book, the first thing I said is, I would love to do this big fancy graphic novel, but I have got to ink myself or I'm not interested. When those words came out of my mouth, I thought, what am, what am I saying? This is exactly what I want. What am I doing? Maybe I'll find a good ink. I mean, that other, that little nervous a uh, fairy that sits on your shoulder and tells you all the bad stuff. And then, and uh, Richard Bruning was the editor says, yeah, no problem. It was, that was it. Yeah, no problem. And I went, well, that was easy. That's the book that made my career. I love dead man. I'm, I've, I've always been a dead man, like a, a fan of dead man, the character, like yeah. for some reason, I don't know what made me gravitate to, I've always loved like the, I guess you could say like the lesser tier characters. Yeah, me too. You know, the B, to the B that, level. But, yeah. The triple A. <laughs> yes. But those are the characters that I have gravitated towards. You know, yes, I like the other characters too, but I love Dead Man so much. And your rendition is one of my favorites of all time. Like it's well, such a departure you. from everything before. The way you made him look, like he looks creepy as fuck, you yeah. know, compared yep. to what he looked like before. Um, so what what was your experience like going from like you said marvel wouldn't really let you ink your own stuff so what was that like for you to kind of for lack of a better way of saying it being unleashed and allowing yourself to like just there work? is no under underestimating or underselling the sheer power of freedom anything can happen and out of what i thought was a failed career failure makes you be 10 times better because you know what went wrong. They don't know what went wrong, mm -hmm. you know? 
They might even say, and they did at Marvel, nothing went wrong. You're selling comics. But I was so unhappy. And I felt like a failure. So out of failure comes all the opportunity. Out of if There's nothing like when you're free. So anything can happen. And I have all this feeling, Ryan. And the first day I totally freeze because all I can think of is Neil Adams. All I can think of is Neil Adams did it better. Neil Adams, Neil Adams, Neil Adams. And I didn't think skeletal weird guy yet. Mm -hmm. I was thinking scary, you know, but presentation. And I drew all day and drew all day and drew all day. And I get up in the morning and I go, that's rotten. That's just terrible art. That would not make me do any. This is what I waited for. And that's not it. So I go and I sit on my couch and I'm very, now I'm, get, it's dark. And um, that's when it hit me, was dead man, just he's dead. And that will be his superpower is how he looks. It will be upsetting whenever you see him. Mm -hmm. And when he does, I mean, with dead man's case, when he does use his power, you don't see him. So he should look really awful. And you think, oh, my God, that's possessing somebody. So I spent a day or so. I still have this little book of sketches I did. And in there are just dead man in all those positions, all this stuff. And I sit down to draw it the next day and it just flows. Because an idea will do that. It's not your talent. It's not your technical skills. That is only necessary to get you to the plate. It's what do you do with that? What will make you different? What will connect with someone? And ideas are what do, that's where all style comes out of ideas anyway. So it just exploded. And then, like I said, when they let me ink myself, I was to fully realize that vision uh, much more viscerally. And God bless DC. They said, yeah, keep doing it. They didn't go, oh, my God, it's not Neil Adams. They went, yeah, that's fine. Go ahead. I was expecting, you know, the axe to come down. Mm -hmm. And for me to say, well, this is what I meant. This one book and the only one I ever that this is how I saw it, you know, and rightfully fired me for this, you know, but it was it was uh, the opposite. And what was good was. They didn't say to me, why did you do this like you? They didn't ask any of it. They just said, this looks cool. This this actually works. So at that point, whenever I would go there, I started to say, well, uh, or for any other characters, I started doing that same thing where I would just go, well, let me think about this. Before I would look at another guy's work or think about it in the traditional sense, let me think about this and see what happens. If, if something comes, I'll use it. And if nothing, then I'll try to follow the age old style but I'll just see what happens. And, and that has served me very well. And how did that lead to eventually you collaborate with Neil Gaiman? Um, you do seasons well, of Mist. He loved dead man. Nice. He saw it and he thought that's really cool. Um, I did one fill in of a swamp thing for, with, uh, the, his editor, Karen Berger. I didn't know him at all. And she really, she was just saying how much she liked it to, you know, boy, this guy just turned in a really great issue of, of Swamp Thing. And I penciled and inked that too. Because now I was just saying, I want to ink myself. First of all, I don't think anyone was going to understand me. And at that point, he's, he was saying, God, I just saw his dead man. I really like that. Do you think he'd be interested in doing an issue of Sandman? She goes, well, I can ask him. And so they let me do, I think, issue 17, which was Calliope. So I did that one. And I thought that was a one and done because I was making plans to go on to do other stuff. And and that led to The Dream of a Thousand Cats, which was a late book. And its its appeal to me was all these other artists had refused to draw it because there's no Sandman in it, it's just cats, which I understand. But for me, that's like, as soon as they said, no one, these other artists don't want to do it. I said, yes, 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 get, yes. And, and I'll work with it, I'll do whatever. He loved that one too. That was like two in a row. So then he sent me um, just a one sheet typing paper with the outline to cease and submit. He hadn't written it yet. And he just said, this is kind of what's going to happen. This is my, I want this to be my magnum opus on Sandman, which will be explain everything that happened and everything that will happen. 
it will center on these group of stories. And would you be interested? I said, absolutely. You know, absolutely. And then I tell them, don't tell me, you know, you don't have to tell me every detail. I'll do it. And then we just talked over it, you know, as it was going. That I think is probably the most organic one because there was a lot of talking about that. Normally, Neil would send a script fully formed to you. Mm -hmm. But these were going back and forth, just a lot of discussion. And I think it shows that they're they're very, very kinetic. And that one, because Malcolm Jones had inked most of them, he was working with Doug Mensch and that and that. Doug had liked what he was seeing and said, I have this Batman thing if you'd be interested. And it's like, I never, ever. And that's when it's like the Yankees called you up to play second base, you mm -hmm. know, if you do this. And. I remember Malcolm telling me, can I have your phone number? Doug wants to talk to you. And I just, Doug Mensch is going to call oh, the whole day and evening because he's going to call next morning. It was like butterflies because that, that, that's an established dude who'd been around, you know, at that point, 15, 20 years or whatever, was one of the major writers who in, I mean, you, Alan Moore would do an interview. Doug Mensch influenced me and you'd see all these guys would just say that was one of the dudes and he is i mean his stuff stands the test of time mm -hmm. and that was that was like okay at this point now horror comics are great but now this is <clears throat> the big show and everyone's going to look at you and everyone's everyone's been clawing to get to spider-man superman or batman i hadn't <clears throat> i was happy with swamp thing dead man uh these uh, sandman these characters that were like you said the uh, second tier B level things mm -hmm. and that was a life changer the other ones were career changers but batman was a life changer i mean that's where i discovered your work yeah. i mean it's yeah such because a they're printing 10 million times more yeah. than they are yeah. the others well yeah i mean it, it's such a departure from like look you know batman gets his back broken right i mean and yeah. then it's about him getting the mantle back and then yeah. you come in with you know like with doug mitch and like costume is completely different you got the super long ears and it's just yep. like the the gloves everything about it it's just so visceral and it's yeah. such a unique way of approaching batman that's such a departure from what we just witnessed you know just a few months back and it's like one of my favorite runs of batman i recently like because i was missing some and i knew we were going to be talking so i went back and i started rereading all of it and like filling in like the gaps and it's it's just as good now as when I was reading it as a kid. You know, yeah. Doug, when you're in it, and certainly for me, I was just thinking in the moment, each issue, what I do. Doug was the one who said, at one point I remember telling him, because uh, sometimes you're so close to it, you can't see what you just, you're just working on it. And I remember I had a couple days off, which was rare between something and my eyes rested and I was out somewhere and I saw it on the stands and my heart just went to my gut. I was like, oh my God, is that how I look? Because I, it's so different. Even I was a, aware of the difference. So I called Doug and I said, are you sure this is the direction? And Doug came right back and says, this is timeless what we're doing, right? I've worked on the ones that aren't timeless. This is timeless. And it's because of what you're doing and your interpretation, which is dead on. He says, I haven't told you once how to do it, have I? And I said, no. And he says, and I haven't said how to tweak it or whatever. You just sh showed this to me. And he must have told Danny O'Neill because then Danny O'Neill calls and says, I just want you to know my job is to sell it. Your job is to do this, what you're doing, which is really terrific right now. So at that point, I went, well, Doug had to have said something to him. After that, OK, it was fine. You know, I, I just, you're so close sometimes you don't know it. Mm -hmm. And then I would look at the rest of the world and it all, you know, it was all like image and stuff like that. And I was like, well, I think I'm using three bottles of ink per issue to their three bottles of ink per 12 issues. You know, it's like, I'm just, it's so dark. And, uh, but the colorist was Greg Wright. And he said, Kelly, this is the most fun I've had working. I got something to do. I'm not fixing anything. I'm just coloring it. John Beatty, the same thing. He says it's so graphic. I'm. Uh, it, this is an absolute. As much work as it is, this is a delight to do. So I was surrounded by good people, and uh, that was my nervous Nelly moment, and it was over. And then I just went to town. You know, um, again, what I used to do is with Batman. I just thought, 
a lot of guys would say, well, if I was Batman, I would do this. Or if I was Batman, I would do that. And I go, I can't imagine myself being Batman. I, that, that would be the worst Batman ever. It's like, why is Batman running away? You know, so, <laughs> um, so mine was the, the, if I was the prey of Batman, what would affect me? If he was coming after me. So I started thinking, and that's where the cape and the ears, because I saw him as a shadow or as a silhouette. Uh, he didn't really come out in the daylight like Cap and beat the hell out of you. He would threaten you. And I will be there. And you don't know when I'll be there. And that started to, again, the idea started drawing the book. Um, to little things, like I used to tell him all the time, when people see the bat signal, they're going to be afraid. It isn't like, oh, good, Batman's coming, because they don't know. They think he's a villain. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, oh, my God, he's loose. The police can't do anything about it. Get into your house and lock the door. We know that because they don't do it when the Joker's loose. They don't do it when the Penguin's loose. They only do it when this guy's loose. And we don't know anything of his motivation. The reader does. It's it, But I'm thinking the people of Gotham don't know. And so that would that would energize the drawing. So I, I always told Doug, I'm not going to waste a shot. Do not have him eating a sandwich. Don't have him picking flowers for... he He's Batman. When he's got it on, it's like, you know, Marlon Brando became Don Corleone with the, that's how he is. He's a, he is that guy. He's always Bruce, but part of his superpower is intimidation. Mm -hmm. And so I just did it from that, that standpoint. So whenever people would see him or they would say to me, God, he's always like doing, I guess, because even with Gordon around, he's in character and it worked. It, it started, it, it became enough to where Neil Adams came up to me at a show once. And he placed me very highly in the rankings of, he says, what I was in the 70s, you were in the 90s. It was as definitive and unique and you were your own guy. And it was very kind of him to say that because I was thinking at that time, I looked at it on the stands and go, what the hell am I doing? What? Oh my God. It isn't like a no confidence thing. It's just, it, it was so different even to me. And that's that unconscious part. There's, Kelly in the waking world. And then there's Kelly, the artist who goes into a Zen like trance and isn't aware of everything until, and then I come out of it and I turn in the art and Kelly in the waking world was very shocked at Kelly, the transcendental meditation guy, you know? <laughs> I mean, I, like I said, I, I adore that run. I think like from the way you depict him doing his detective work to the, you know, black mask storyline that you guys mm -hmm. kicked off with your, dead man connection story the swamp thing single issue yeah. with killer croc in there you know and uh the specter two-parter yeah. like the specter was yeah the specter I was a good one love i love and this look another character i love the specter yeah you know like i'm a huge fan and to this day it makes me sad there's not specter comics coming out right now you know, you know what i i think that's part of the fallout of modern comics is they aren't working their B-level characters uh, where you let new talent or talent that uh, wants to kind of try something new do it. You don't change pre-existing characters to garner it. They have to be your flagships. So you stay in canon and they're, they're your guys. You can do, I mean, they put me on Batman, so you can do different stuff. But the second tier books, there should be absolutely a specter. There should be a creeper. There should be the demon. They should all still be made. You push those as hard. Um, but, you know, a lot of the marketing is gone now from these companies. They used to have a personal relationship with store owners. Mm -hmm. I used to have to go and do that uh, kind of promotion. Not so much even for fans, but for the store owners. Um, and that's gone. And those were the guys who sold it. They would be doing what you just did. Wow, I want a Spectre book. And they would tell their uh, their customers. And then they would want one. And it that's how it worked. The reason, the reason Doug used to put all those characters in, uh, like the Spectre or Dead Man or whatever, was he wanted a really cool Brave and the Bold going on within Batman. And at that time, Batman got to be separate from all the other books. So he could just tell these wild stories and he loved those characters too. And that's why he told me, and it's good that you, that you're heartening to hear that was that he had said to me on a couple of occasions, not often, these will stand. You will, Kelly, they're, they're going to, 
that's why I'm proud of these. I know these will will last. And so when eventually they did reprint them, I hadn't read them for, well, why do, you know, I, I never did. I did them at the time and you move on. Mm -hmm. But when I sat down, to, they sent me a make ready. It was emotional because I went, these are good. My, you Now I'm completely away from it. I have none of the battle hardened what's going on we got to keep taking territory i was done i was off doing other things 10 years 15 years down the road and i went i can't believe how good these are how how when you're with other good people they they do bring you up uh when you're with talented editors like danny was and like they, he that is what makes fans and it's why when you go back and look for old issues it happened to me. You go, these were good. Wow, this is really cool. Cool. It it was if if a hundred years from now they're still talking about this, I'll be very I'll know I be I will be in my little niche was those three years on Batman. That will be it. And I'll be pretty happy with it. I never care that people when you do a show or they appear whatever they say, Kelly Batman Jones, I will take that. That I should go and have my name formally changed at the DMV, but that was <laughs> that was cool because I never saw that coming in my wildest dreams. I mean, look, just, look, like you said, it's it's also like what was coming out back then, like a lot of the image type of art, right? Mm -hmm. Like in yours was definitely something that stood out. I would say like Magnolia too back then. Mm -hmm. um, both of you were very different than like the. Well, we came up from the all our, our influences were the early mid seventies. And these guys were coming up after that and they were pretty much doing a mixture of like Mike Golden and Barry Windsor Smith and all the lines. Mm -hmm. But what happened was they all started doing it for them. I always thought it was because you can see a lot of them don't do that anymore, but they all were doing this. It was hard to tell who was who unless it was Jim or, or Todd. Where I, the one thing I was aware of it was um, and it was huge. You got to, everyone forgets how big that was and how it influenced Marvel and DC artists. But I thought at the time, well, the more for me to stand out, you know, and the more for me, I'm now these guys aren't, they're not after the uh, artistic objectives I am. So I will look different. And I'll, and you know what, if, if someone doesn't like it, fine, there's a million other books that look all kind of the same, but then there's me. And I, we started actually selling more and more than they, it, it, our sales kept increasing. And I think it was because simply, I would love to say it was me, but I think it was because it was a different book. They were one and dones, two parters. You weren't having, you didn't have to buy every other thing. They were distilled, reduced down to what he was Batman to. I mean, he was a detective who used intimidation. That was his, that was his shtick. And he was always at night. It was just really, it was perfectly cool Batman, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Batman didn't have relationships. Batman, didn't, he didn't have his sidekicks with me. He didn't, it, Doug wanted him lean and mean, and that was it. And uh, I was more than happy. Yeah, I can only think of Robin in there maybe a couple of times. I know, like, there's early, like, Bruce didn't want him around because he didn't want to, like, worry about him. And then Robin comes and kind of helps him at one point, but that's it. It's yeah, it was moment. it was pretty much at the beginning. Doug had to get rid of him because Doug didn't want to. He didn't like Robin. He didn't not his character. He just said, "Go do your own book, be your own character." But with Batman, that's a that's a shtick. I don't want to do it. And occasionally he would be said, "You got to have him just to remind." Da, 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 you know, so he would have him come on like a panel here or there or so, whatever. Or uh, Doug's favorite was on the phone. <laughs> you know, yeah. It's like Robin says. <laughs> Yeah. So he would avoid it because he wanted to just tell these stories. And he did. I think they, uh, I look at them now, especially when I read them. And it is, uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to say the names because I'm, then it sounds like I'm elevating he and I, and I'm, I don't mean it that way, but it's like when you have two uh, Roger Waters and David Gilmore, they can find, but together it really worked. And yes. and it was that thing when when we were doing Batman together, I, I think it was his best Batman was with me and it was mine. I mean, it was just it just worked. And his, his skills 
were that he brought an underlying tension to even when Batman wasn't doing something like confronting a villain. There was always this tension with him. I don't know how he did it. I never asked him. I just I just loved it. Yeah, I think there's a certain synergy that that happens when, you know, two collaborators come together and it just it clicks and you guys definitely I think we saw it the same way that we never really discussed it. Mm -hmm. You know, I came to it from my point of view and he took it and ran. I mean, he was the guy uh, at Denny and he had a good relationship. So Denny would just let him go. And I don't really remember Denny. Denny would read him over and he would check everything. He certainly did that. But there were a couple of times things got late or things uh, with, with, with Denny's world. And I know he just, had doug send me script directly he just would try he trusted us that much Mm -hmm. and then he would come on to it a little later and uh he he would say to me you know i said well did we owe we're okay boss and he said yeah he says you made my life easier i didn't have to work on it this month i he was putting out all these other fires so so at that point you take that not so much as a compliment that, but that Denny, who knew Batman inside out and backwards, was agreeing with his portrayal. And he, had, Denny, once said, he says, "Well, it's like you're doing a modern, golden age style Batman. It's like if you were to take the sensibilities of the '40s and and your presentation and mix it all together. This is what we're getting." Um, and I like, I I loved hearing that. Yeah, I like that. I don't think I've heard that before, but that yeah. totally, totally makes sense. Well, that was Denny's assessment was it was like reading 1943 Batman or something, you know. Mm-hmm. So I want to jump a little forward um, before we wrap up. I want to ask sure. you, like you illustrated Len Wein's last Swamp Thing story. Yep. Um, and obviously, like like I said, you you drew him in before you drew him in the Batman run. I yep. think you, you're the one of the perfect artists for that character. Just, Thank you. It definitely suits your sensibilities. How did that project with len come about len had wanted to work with me for years and years and i didn't really know it i'd done an unpublished archie story he wrote uh late 80s and it wasn't because he called me or whatever it was archie i knew the editor he says i have a len ween script would you want to draw it i drew it they took the orders then the publisher at archie saw it and said there's no way i will let this be published because it was a horror story with a lot of stuff going on and that was heartbreaking because they had had orders of like six hundred thousand, and he was gonna now they would have published it right but then no because everyone thought of archie and jughead and all that so uh, and i really didn't get a chance to talk to len with that he it was just in the pencil stage john Beatty. that was the first time we ever really worked together had inked a few pages um, the Comics Buyer's Guide published those. Uh, the editor had got them in there. It went through the roof. And then that's when the publisher saw it and canceled it. So I didn't really get to interact with him. Um, eventually when I did, and he called me to do Swamp Thing, I think it was in Convergence at that time. And he didn't want to really do what they were doing, but he said, if I have you and I write the story I want, I can ignore those. It's almost like Doug. I can ignore the elements I don't want. We can just do this thing. But first, let me ask you, what do you think about Swamp Thing? Um, who, what is Swamp Thing to you? And I said, well, I said, I do love what Morin Bissett did. And I, I love Nancy Collins stuff. But to me, it's still a guy who got turned into a monster. And it's Alec Holland who got turned into a monster. And it's just the way it'll always be to me. Um <clears throat> And he can do all those things. I can have, and Len said, exactly. And this is exactly. Now, Len edited, brought in Alan Moore, encouraged it, go further with it. But Len still saw it that way too. I always said it's a big green uh, Lon Chaney Jr. And um, you feel sorry for him, but he's a monster. And uh, had a blast from him from that moment on. He wrote the most visual, fun comic books. In fact, that was his, his thing, was to always say fun. We're going to have fun. And uh, I had a blast. When he passed, though, he knew that DC wanted it as a monthly book. They had actually said they didn't know how ill he was. I mean, they knew he was ill, but they didn't know he was that ill. He called me and he was so excited that 
based on the merits of the book and its sales, which sales are big that you've got to sell. And at that time we came in, I don't know, they have like the, the top 50 books and we were like number 18 uh, for Swamp Thing, a book you didn't need, you know, it was not, it wasn't tied to anything. It didn't have any heroes in it. So he was very pleased with that. It had sold well. It hadn't alienated the hardcore Alan Moore type of thinking. And uh, at that point, he told me over the phone what he wanted to do. We talked about it. He started planning it, but he just got more and more ill. And he got one last script written. Uh, he used to work with, the, there was DC and Marvel style. DC is the all the dialogues in the script. Marvel is, it's just paragraphs describing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I got that and I started drawing it. And then that's when he passed. DC, God bless him, said, why don't you finish that? And we'll publish it because they had a special coming up with Tom King and Jason Fabic, and we'll just publish it in the back. And we won't even put in the dialogue. We'll just print the script and show the art. And they've done that now about three times. They did it in it was a bad year because Bernie had died that same year. And so I back to back almost I finished Len's last job and I finished Bernie's Frankenstein. So. That was a weird thing because it was those two guys that made me learn the names of creators when I saw Swamp Thing as a kid. Before, I just read comic books. But when I read Swamp Thing, that made me say, well, who would make that? And they had these weird, wonderful names. Ween and Wrightson. That's just, of course, that's the only that's the only kind of a name that would create this stuff. So, so I had carried them in my heart all those years just mercilessly nerd geek them anytime about everything bernie was always self-effacing len loved hearing it you know <laughs> tell me more tell me more what else did you love and i would tell him something or i would ask him a question on on how they did things and he would remember from years earlier he'd remember a panel and uh but i used to do that all the time he'd call me and it was 25 minutes of me interviewing him about various <laughs> aspects of his career Bernie was always, oh, shucks. Now anyone could do it. And you go, no, not anyone can do it. And Len went, yeah, it was me. I did it. I'll tell, tell you all about it. It was great. Um, so that was a rough, that was a bad time. But the biggest honor I've ever had was those, getting to finish those things. Bernie actually asking me to do it. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Len being told his book had been a-okay for a, for a run. That was wonderful. Yeah, it sucks to to know that we didn't get that run between the two of you doing a small uh, thing. He, you know, they had told him they was going to give him a year, see what they, he would do. Um, we had a couple of really good productive talks on what we would do. They were, he took some ideas I had and he was running with it. And, did, but he just, you know, his body gave out and you can't fault a guy for that. But he died loving what he was doing. He died knowing this. Is uh, Swamp Thing a character you see yourself ever going back to? I would love to. Yeah, I love Swamp Thing. I think I would, uh, I, I mean, my thing was always less philosophical, more horror. I always wanted to do a, a couple of, the, in fact, I would go back and dig up the stuff and present it to whoever and say, this is what Len and I wanted to do. We don't have to do that, but there are some things here that are pretty good as just horror goes and sometimes you want a horror book to be that yeah just to be that uh it's like a conan book you want a conan book to just be that doesn't have to do anything else but he's drinking wenching and killing that's it you know add a wizard here a monster there <laughs> you know? it's what we want <laughs> yeah i mean i would love to see a swamp thing like i a black label book by you like just yep. all you like that Me too. sounds like the perfect pairing you know like i was to do uh, it's funny you say that i was to do that with dead man i'd come up with a six issue thing got it all written out everything was fine and then that editor was quit or fired and they changed up the whole thing and you really need that editor to shepherd you through yeah. and run interference. And I just, there was at that point, I never resubmitted because I didn't know these other people. And I don't think they would have agreed with my sensibilities on it and how much 
visceral horror I had in it. And uh, because I, you know, at one point I wanted Dead Man, the, the point with Dead Man I wanted to always make was if he takes over someone and you would lose your consciousness and you didn't know what was going on, he was putting in harm's way. It's tacitly rape. And so he has to not do that. But I always said when he does, bad things happen. It gets so he's got to find another way to do what he does. And one of them I had was he gets into somebody to do what you think is the right thing because it's a really bad thing. And while he's going there, the moon comes up and he got into a guy who's a werewolf. And now he can't get out. And the werewolf spirit's loving this because now Dead Man had a front row seat to the absolute horror. And the guy who was a werewolf, used to, what he used to do was when he knew it was coming, he'd go into his basement, chain himself up, nothing happened. But because he did this, now the, the issue went from going to fight the bad dude to killing all these innocent people, making the ones that survived werewolves. And the whole time, the wolf spirit laughing, saying, in this fun, watch what I'm going to do. You're right there. And he can't get out. He can't control it. And he can't get out. When the sun comes up, this guy's soaked in blood. He does. He now knows what he did. He failed his little trick. His wife had come up with locking him up. Didn't work. He comes home soaked in blood. The news is 20 murders. Dead man's following him and he doesn't know what he can't speak. Can't communicate. There's no way. Goes into his basement. His wife is pleading with him and he blows his brains out. And that was that story. He blows his brains out and dead man's left like this. Now, my editor loved it. Len loved that as a thing we were, he wanted to throw that in somewhere. But, you know, the political powers change and they tell you that's too horrific. <laughs> you know, that's, our heroes don't do that. I go, no, they don't. This guy did, but he misused his power. You know? Damn, I'd um, buy that book. I want that book. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it was a brutal thing it was brutal um and then it had the universal horror tragedy at the end which a werewolf does he he doesn't want to be this and dead man made it happen that was one of the things so so i wanted to start you just start with that to let everyone know okay that's a boundary he can't go into that mm -hmm. right and then you have to come up with horror stories with him which was a pleasure and again comics evolve i think I think what was acceptable in 1990 or 2000 probably isn't now um, to the detriment of comics because we are the cutting edge of a lot of this stuff. And if you offend, okay, you know, that's yeah. the nature of art anyway. And a comic book, it doesn't mean going overboard and being adult. It means It means taking people on a journey and telling a true story. That's what I like. I don't really need to know how Batman's shoes work, but I do need him to be in a sincere, authentic place. And then I'll accept it. That way then you can have from Tim Sale to David Finch to Neil Adams to whoever drawing, it wouldn't matter. Doesn't matter because it's sincere and authentic. Yeah, I totally agree. Like, I, I mean, I think there's a place for stories like that. That's why they have the Black Label line. Right. It's for mature readers. You know, it's... 18 and over or 17 and over, whatever you well, want to say. Well, yeah, and when I was coming up, it was Elseworld, mm -hmm. which they should bring back. Elseworld was a great idea. I love Elseworld. Yeah, because it, it was hit or miss. It was brand new territory, mm -hmm. you know, and Vampire Batman made my name. Yeah, that's another great, but I yeah. mean, there's so much good stuff that you've done. Um, and you're working on, I know you're working on like some detective comics covers, a run of that, yep. but what else is next for you? What else? I have, there? I'm not one of those guys who likes to say it's the best thing I ever did. Cause that, no, 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 it, it, but it's the thing I'm as satisfied with as I was a lot of dead man, for example. And it's a first of four graphic novel store uh series with uh matt wagner who's writing it and each one are self-contained stories but it's the same character as he evolves and it is pure horror yes. it, and that's as much as they'll let me say because i call i got a hold of him and said can i announce can i say because you're going to announce it in about six weeks or so and I, no, no no i don't know why I keep secrets i don't know i don't know why sell it <laughs> you know, yeah. tell people they'll get excited. It doesn't make a difference. Um, <clears throat> but when they do, 
it's it's going to knock people out. It it is such a good story by Matt Wagner. I mean, what a pairing, you and Matt Wagner. I'm excited. I, I'm here I think for it. I well, <clears throat> Matt and I have been very good friends for 32 years, 33 years, something like that, a long time. And we never got to work to with each other. He was doing stuff and we would talk about it and then I would be pulled here, he'd be go there. It just finally you just have to say, you know, we're going to do this. And I got a hold of him. He had said something in an interview or a Facebook post or something and I just said, "When are we going to do something?" cuz I would do it. So he called me up and says, do you mean it? And, he, and I said, yeah. I said, I mean it. And he says, okay. And uh, initially to go through a publisher, but as he wrote it, you could say, they're going to say no to this. It doesn't matter. It's he and I. They're going to say no. And he'd say, no, 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 no. We'll try. And then it, was, it got to it got to the point to where to keep the, the – the, I don't want to say integrity. To keep the thing that I could see making it work. And making it brand new and making it electric, you couldn't do it. You just, there's no way. And I can understand it. It's like the way it was when I told you anything could happen. When I did Dead Man in 88 or whatever, you could do anything. You know, any depiction, any, anything. Because the sincerity of the story didn't make it like, oh, you're being salacious. But as I told Matt, I said he did a great thing. I call, I call what he writes literary pulp. Meaning, it's very highbrow. It's very there's themes and and symbolism and boy, it's like a Roger Corman movie. It delivers all the way. You know, it's exploitative. It's violent. It's everything you need to keep you going. Uh, Scorsese at his best does that. You know, and I would tell him this is wonderful. I said. I'm going, oh, that's a really interesting point. And that's a lot of blood. And you can put those together. It's wonderful. I mean, if that's what I want in my comics, right? Mm -hmm. So essentially, that's what I mean by authentic. I feel like I'm being myself. And, well, and I think the art's amongst the best I've done. It will rank amongst the best I've ever done. Um, very excited. Yeah, I am. I've been sitting on this thing. The good thing is it's all done. So when they announce it, it isn't like, and then they're going to work on it. It's finished. So is this creator? I mean, I know you can't say much. Yeah, but creator owned. Okay, very good. But all the people that are around it, they tell you yeah. you can't and this. Yeah. Matt and I are going bonkers because it's like, well, what's the what different? You know, if we can just say it, we could just say it. Because, you know, you're looking at a hundred pages of art and a told, a well-told story. And then I've already started the second one. Again, it's he did a neat trick. They're separate but connected. But if you read number two, you'd never have to read number one. If you read number four, you don't have to read number three, two, or one. That's what I wanted. I said, you know, when people say I'm going to do, or when I see Marvel or DC say, we're going to have a big, huge event and 36 issues, and I'm going, I don't have time. Yeah. You know, I don't have time. But if they told me these things are all independent of one another, but to get when you get to a certain point, it will hit you. But even if you didn't, uh, Jack Kirby's Fourth World with the New Gods, Mister Miracle, Forever People did that trick. Mm -hmm. If you read them individually, fine. When you get to the issue of Revelation, I think it's New Gods Seven, your mouth drops open. And I say to the, I don't, no spoilers. If you have not read those people, read them in order. And when you get to issue seven, it'll knock your socks off. Um, and that's what I always, I, you know, Matt did a neat trick where he does that. And you just go, this is wicked. It's really, and wicked is the word, not wicked like cool, but this is a wicked thing. He, It's wicked. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. great. But Matt tells a story without an agenda, without a point, without anything, just entertain you and a point and from a place of sincerity and authenticity. So it's, yes, very offensive. Mm -hmm. I, I can't wait. And I, I the way you know, a comic I, book should be a comic book should be those things, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, look, I'm, I'm super amped for it. I think I love your work. I love his work. So to see you guys collaborating on something together, it's, it's amazing. Well, in all honesty, I put it amongst the very best stories I have ever gotten. And, and I can tell when I read it, I could tell he'd put a lot of effort in this for a long time before I came along. I mean, he knew what he wanted to do. He just, I think he didn't know if he would, do it himself or hire someone to do it 
or work with someone to do it. When I came along, I was I, like dead man. I was in that place where I go, I really need to do something like this. I didn't know what it was. So when he, but I need that kind of refreshing, uh, exciting experience again. Well, I, I can't, like I said, I keep saying it, but I can't wait. And I hope DC lets you do that dead man story because I want to uh, read that too. You know, we'll, we'll see my fingers crossed. You know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe DC will, uh, you know, as things go, you never know. I mean, yeah. I've had a bad history with dead man from an early success because three times they've stepped, I've stepped up to where they wanted to do, let me do my own thing. <clears throat> Every time the editor is either fired or retired or quits. Right when you get to that point, and you have got to have that, yeah, editor shepherd you, you know. I totally get it, man. Well, yeah. I want to, I want to just say thank you so much for for chatting thank with me today. Me. It has been an absolute pleasure, and I definitely would love to have you back on again sometime, especially when this mystery book with you and Matt's if out you to want, talk about it. If you want, I will, I will do that. All right, sounds good, man. Thank you again, okay. and um, I'm thank gonna drop are. all the links for where people can follow you online on social media and all that good stuff. Okay. And uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Thank you very much, Ryan. This was great.